In this section I'm going to cover reaction mechanisms. So we generally describe chemical reactions with an equation that lists all the reactants and all the product molecules. But the probability of more than three molecules colliding at the same instant with the proper orientation and sufficient energy is negligible. So what we've seen is that um, two particles in our pinball example in the last video. So when two particles bounce around, uh, they can sometimes hit each other in the proper orientation. Although, um, as the particles bounce around, and depending on how complicated that orientation is, the likelihood that they hit each other with the right orientation becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, for three particles, three or more particles, to hit each other all at the same spot and in the exact right orientation, is the probability of that is almost nothing. So that means that the, although it's possible for that to occur, the rate of those reactions occurring would be so, so slow that other reactions are going to occur before that happens. So um, most reactions occur in a series of small reactions involving one or two or three molecules. Um, but uh, they don't all react at the exact same time. So when we talk about a chemical reaction that has reactants on one side and products on the other, we're usually leaving out lots of parts that happen in the middle. So we might have a reaction that goes from A plus B and it ends up over here, makes E plus F, right? But in the middle we have C So we might have a reaction that says A plus B makes D, but the reaction might actually unfold like this, A plus B makes C, and that makes C prime, and that makes C double prime, and then that makes D. So the actual reaction might look something like this. So if this is the way that the reaction unfolds, then why would we just write it like this? Well, generally the reason is because these steps in the middle, these steps are called intermediates. The reaction generally does not stop with intermediates. The reaction generally will create these intermediates and then they get carried forward to eventually become product. So at the end of a reaction, if C is not listed as a product in the general chemical f equation of that reaction, then that means that at the end of the reaction there won't be any C or C prime or C double prime. All of these will have moved forward and turned into product on their way to becoming product. So it's true that they exist during the reaction, but they don't stick around. So we have reactants that are there before. We have products that are there after. And in the middle, we have intermediates. But during the course of the reaction, those intermediates will be all used up, and they'll all move forward to become products. So this sequence of steps this going to this, going to this, going to this, going to this. All of these, this sequence of steps here um, showing how reactants become products, this is called the reaction mechanism. So if we know the rate law of the reaction, that helps us understand the mechanism. If we know how, um, whether a, rate, a reaction is first order or second order or zero order, that helps us understand the steps that happen in between that we can't see, that kind of uh, are there for a moment and they disappear on their way to becoming products. So here's an example of a reaction mechanism. H2 gas plus two 
um, iodochlorine molecules makes two hydrogen chloride molecules plus iodine. So ICL and the H's replace the I's, right? So I have two ICLs and then I have two HCLs. So this is the overall reaction. When I start the reaction, I have all, only reactants and I have zero products. And when the reaction's over, I have just products. Maybe I have a little bit of reactant left, depending on what the yield is and how far the reaction's going to go. But there is only, the, at the end of the reaction, the only things that will be there would be this, or this, or this, or this. That's it. Those are the only four things that are going to be in this reaction at the end. But the reaction unfolds in a way that's not seen when we just look at the overall reaction. So here, there's two steps in this mechanism. The first step is that hydrogen gas, one molecule of hydrogen gas, collides with one molecule of ICL. The reaction would have us believe that H2 reacts with two molecules of ICL. But that, in the mechanism, it only happens one step at a time. So the H2 runs into one molecule of ICL, and that makes HCl and HI. Right, so there's two H's here. One of the H's goes to the CL, one of the H's goes to the I. So then I get HCl and HI. The H2 has been broken apart, and one H has gone to each of these. Well, HI does not appear in the overall reaction. HI is created in this reaction, but then look what happens in the next step. That molecule of HI is going to react with another molecule of ICL. So now HI reacts with ICL. And what that does is that this I and this I are going to join up to make I2. And then the H, the leftover H, and the leftover CL are going to join up to make HCL. So when the first step of this mechanism happens, HI is created. But then in the second step of the mechanism, HI is used up. Right, so it's created, and then it's used up. So this is an intermediate. And if I add these two reactions together, just like I put a bar under there and put a plus here, like I'm adding them together, then to add two reactions together, things that appear on opposite sides of the reaction get canceled out. That's kind of like if I have a 2 on each side of the reaction or an x on each side of the reaction, then those cancel each other out. So here, this hi on this side and this hi on this side aren't actually part of the overall reaction. And when I add these two together, I have, in this row, I have 1h2. Then here I have icl and icl, so that's 2 icl. And then here I have HCl and HCl, so that's two HCl. And in this row, since HI canceled, since it appeared on the left side and on the right side, then the only thing that I have left in this row is I2. So when I add up the steps from the mechanism, I add up step one and step two, they show me that adding step one and step two gives me the overall reaction. Right, that intermediate disappears. It doesn't actually appear in the overall reaction because as soon as it's created, it gets used up. So when I look at a series of mechanistic steps, one, two, three, four, and all the, all the mechanistic steps are really just little reactions, right? This reaction, and then this reaction, and then this reaction, and they all add up to equal this overall reaction. So um, whenever we're drawing a mechanism like this, this is how I can recognize the intermediates. An intermediate is something that appears in, as a, a product in one step, and it appears as a reactant in the next step, so it gets used up. So H2 plus 2ICLO. I see what happened here. This is supposed to go up here. So when these get canceled out and I add these two reactions together, the two steps of the mechanism, then I get the overall reaction. So each step here is called 
Each step in the mechanism is called an elementary step. And when I look at an elementary step, I could do something that I can't do with an overall reaction. So I'm going to circle these and call these elementary steps. And this on top is the overall reaction. So I can do something with elementary steps that I'm not allowed to do with an overall reaction. And that is that when I'm drawing a rate law, so for this first one I would write rate equals K times H2 to the M times ICL to the N. And when I write the rate law for this reaction, I don't know I don't know what H2, what M and N are. Even though I know that the stoichiometric coefficient for H2 is 1, that doesn't mean that M is 1. And even though I know that the coefficient for ICL is 2, that doesn't mean that N is 2. Remember, I have to look at reaction data and I have to actually do some math in order to calculate M and N when I'm looking at an overall reaction, that is. When I'm looking at elementary steps and I know that each step is a step that cannot be broken down further, then I can actually, I can, my intuition is correct at that point. And when I'm writing the rate law for this step, then here rate equals, let's call this K1, and this is K2. All of these Ks are going to be different because I'm talking about different reactions here. So K1, K2, and this step down here I'll have K3. So um, here I have H2 as a reactant, and its coefficient is 1, which means that here this is just 1. And now ICL, I can write ICL, and for this step, since the coefficient is 1, I know that the coefficient here is 1. So for an overall reaction, I have to look at experimental data to calculate M and N. For an elementary step, I don't. I just look at the stoichiometric coefficient like I was tempted to do before, and that will fit. So K3, same thing. Now it's HI and ICL. 1, 1. So um, we can see here that when I write the rate law for an elementary mechanistic step, the stoichiometric coefficient is equal to the order. But that's only true for elementary steps. It is not true for the overall reaction in general. The number of reactant particles in an elementary step is called its molecularity. So we can say that a unimolecular step involves one particle, a bimolecular step involves two particles, they might be the same kind of particle or they might be different, and a termolecular step involves three particles. So again, we talked about this before, but the probability of three particles all running into each other at exactly the right orientation and with enough energy for a reaction to occur is incredibly low. So term molecular steps are very, very rare. So generally, um, a mechanistic step is going to involve just one particle, so that particle can um, decompose. Uh, the particle ha might have bonds in it and the bond a bond will break. And so that's a step that only involves that one particle. A bond within that one particle breaks. Or a bimolecular step is when two particles, that's like with the uh, pinball that we saw, this is a bimolecular reaction because in this reaction I have, let me reset this, in this reaction I have two particles that are, are involved in the reaction. This particle, BC, and this particle A. I need both of those in order for this reaction to occur. 
So this is a bimolecular mechanistic step. If we go back to this mechanism, we can see that elementary step number one, this is a bimolecular elementary step. There are two particles involved in this step. This is a bimolecular elementary step. There are two particles involved in this step. Each step in the mechanism is like its own little reaction with its own activation energy and its own rate law. So we saw that before, but um, uh, the overall reaction is really kind of a fiction. It's kind of a summary of all of the actual steps that occur. And the reason that we focus on the overall reaction rather than looking at the mechanistic steps generally is because at the, when we're looking at a reaction, we want to know what do we get at the end of it. So if HI is part of the process, but it doesn't really appear at the end, then um, it's important information when we look at it uh, for some circumstances when we're looking at it for some applications. But for other applications, when I just want to know what I start with and what I end with, then looking at the mechanistic steps might just be more information than we need. So um, when I look at each mechanistic step, it's really like its own little reaction. Here's one reaction, and this has a rate, and it has an activation energy, and it has a rate law, and it has reactants, and it has products. And here's another reaction, and it has its own rate, and rate law, and it has reactants, and it has products. And when I add them two together, when I add these two together, and I have similar species as products and reactants, then those species get canceled out, and they don't appear in the overall reaction. So then um, this just focuses mostly on what went in and what came out. So here are some more examples. Um, if there's just one particle, we call that uh, a unimolecular reaction. And the rate law it would be first order, right? So the rate law would be rate equals k times a to the 1. A bimolecular step is, it could be a plus a if they're both the same molecule, like oxygen plus oxygen making an O2 molecule. Or they could be uh, two particles, like um, oxygen plus carbon monoxide making carbon dioxide. So Either way, if two particles are involved in the step, we call those bimolecular steps. And the rate laws could either be A squared, because I have two A's, or the rate law could be A times B, because it, one, this is its first order in A, and its first order in B. So again, here are some term molecular reactions that are incredibly rare. Three particles of A all running into each other at the same time. That would have a rate law that looks like this two particles of A running into one particle of B, all colliding with the right orientation and the right energy, would have a rate law like this. And if I had three different particles all colliding at the right time and the right energy, I would have a rate law like this. Now the reason that these are very rare to occur is because if A plus B plus C can all collide to create some product, then it's probably also likely that A plus B can collide to make some product and B plus C can collide to make some product, and A plus C can collide to make some product. So if A is likely to run into B before it runs into B and C at the exact same time, then the reaction between A and B is probably going to occur faster than the reaction between A, B, and C. So it's very, very rare for these kinds of reactions to happen. Unimolecular and bimolecular, these are Generally, when I'm looking at mechanistic steps, it's either one particle or two particles that are involved in the transition state, in the activated complex. So when we're looking at a reaction and we're talking about a mechanism that might have many steps, we're still trying to talk about the rate. And so now we say, OK, we've determined the rate of an overall reaction. But now we're saying that actual reaction is made up of three steps or four steps, four me elementary mechanistic steps. So how, if I've determined the rate of the overall reaction, then how does that relate to the rate of each step, right? Because I have this reaction, this here, I've, I know that the rate of this, I could plug in some data and calculate the rate of this reaction. But how does that relate to the rate of this reaction and the rate of this reaction? They must be related. Well, we have to look for what we call the rate determining step in the mechanism. And the rate determining step is the slowest step. It's the one that has the, the largest activation energy, 
And so it's the highest barrier that has to be overcome and it takes the longest to get up over that hill. So the, when a mechanism has lots of different steps, we don't really care about the rate of any of the steps except the slowest one. The, the rate of the slowest step in the mechanism determines the rate of the entire reaction. So even if a mechanism has six steps, if I've found the one that's the slowest, then the rate of the entire reaction is based on that slow step. The other five steps don't really matter as far as the rate is concerned. So an analogy here, this is an analogy with the, the cars. This one doesn't work as well for me um, as a funnel. So think about this. If you've got a funnel, and it's got a really small pipe down here, then the rate at which water can come out of the really small pipe is determined by the diameter of this little pipe, right? Well, what if you've got a big pitcher of water up here and you're pouring a big pitcher of water in and maybe you pour a little trickle in? Well, if you just pour a little trickle in, then the rate at which you're pouring it in and the rate at which you're pouring it out will probably be about equal, right? Because this is just a trickle in and there's enough room in this small diameter tube for a little trickle to come out. But if you start pouring, dumping all of this water in, then it's gonna start filling up in the funnel pretty quickly to the point where it's coming in really fast and it, the, it can only go out uh, at, a determined, that are, at a rate that's determined by the small diameter of this tube. So it doesn't matter how fast I pour liquid into the funnel, the rate at which liquid exits the funnel is only determined based on this small exit down here. It doesn't matter how fast I pour it in. I could pour it in slow up here, it'll have the same rate. I could pour it in fast up here, it'll have the same rate. I could pour it in really, really, really fast up here, it'll have the same rate. Because the rate is determined by the slowest step. This is step number one. Step number one might be fast, but step number two is always slow because step number two goes through this little tiny little tiny uh, diameter tube. So the rate determining step of a reaction is the one that's like the small part of a funnel. All of the other steps can be really, really fast and it doesn't matter how fast they are. I'm trying to speed, if I'm trying to speed up this whole process, then I need to speed up this part. Speeding up any of the other steps that come before this part won't actually speed up the process. I have to look for the slowest part of the, of the process, the rate determining step. So here's another example of a reaction mechanism. We saw where the nitrogen and carbon, the nitrile group kind of flips around in a, a 180. Here's another example where I have NO2 reacting with carbon monoxide. And when they run into each other like this, one of the oxygens from NO2, the bond between N and O gets broken, and the bond between C and O gets formed. So you can see here, there's a bond between C and O, and this bond between N and O has been broken. So here's the transition state. This particle runs into this particle. They have to be going fast enough when they run into each other. They have to run into each other so that the O here bumps into the C right here, the orientation, the frequency factor. And then we create what's called the transition state. And in the transition state, this bond right here is breaking, it's being weakened, and this bond right here is being formed. These are called partial bonds. Partial bonds, because the transition state is unstable. And so this bond is being, is being broken and this bond is being formed. So what that means is that this oxygen atom right here actually has five bonds. Because remember that this is a double bond between carbon and oxygen. And oxygen also has two lone pairs. It's kind of hard when I'm making them red. Has two lone pairs right here. So oxygen kind of has five areas of electron density when it's in this uh, transition state. This is why it's unstable, because in this form right here, oxygen has broken the octet rule. 
two, four, six, eight, ten. So one of these bonds has to go. Either this bond right here has to go, so then it would only have eight, or this bond right here has to go. Uh, actually, I guess both of these bonds wouldn't be here. Only one or the other would be here. So um, e it's either got to lose these two bonds to carbon, or it's got to lose this bond to nitrogen in order to make something that is stable again, to where over here the oxygen is following the octet rule, or over here the oxygen is following the octet rule. So transition states are unstable. They have to either go this way and become reactants again, or they go this way and become products. So here is an example of a multi-step mechanism when we're looking at a reaction coordinate diagram. So look, there's two humps in this one. That means there's two steps in this mechanism. So the first step of the mechanism shows N2 plus N2 running into each other to make one NO3. So one of these NO2 particles leaves an oxygen with the other. So then I get an NO3 and an NO. So when this happens, in the first step, NO2 and NO2 collide. So here's what that transition state looks like when NO2 and NO2 collide. Two particles collide, bonds are partially formed, bonds are partially broken, um, and I'm leading down to an intermediate. So this part right here, this is an intermediate. Right in the middle. So let's look at what intermediate I have. If I have, if this is my overall reaction, I have NO2 and CO and NO and CO2. NO3 does not appear in my overall reaction. So I'm going to look at NO3 and say, oh, well, it's a product in this first step and it's a reactant in this next step. So NO3 is an intermediate. So when I'm adding mechanistic steps together so that I can generate an overall reaction, then remember I cancel out the intermediates. If it appears as a reactant and as a product, then I can cancel it out. And look at this, I also have NO2 over here and NO2 over here. So if it's a reactant and a product, then I can cancel that one out. Well, now that I've canceled that out, now I can see that what's left over is one NO2, one CO, one NO on the product side, and one CO2 on the product side. So when I'm adding mechanistic steps together, I'm always going to cancel out anything that's a reactant on one side and a product on the other. And so this intermediate that's formed, NO3, NO2 is not an intermediate, NO2 is a reactant, right? Um, so it's not, we would not call it an intermediate because it's here at the beginning of the reaction. An intermediate is something that is not at the beginning and it's not at the end. An intermediate is something that is formed and then disappears. So the, my intermediate right here is NO3. So here's NO2 plus NO2. They run into each other and they make NO3 plus NO. And then NO3 and CO run into each other right here. That's this transition state. And down here I've got uh, NO2 plus CO2. Oh, and I suppose at this step is where NO2 and NO2 run into each other. That's my transition state there. And at this step, this is where NO3 and CO run into each other at this transition state. NO3 and CO. They're going to collide, make an activated complex, and then the NO3 loses one of its oxygens to become NO2 and CO2. So when we're looking at this reaction coordinate diagram, we can see how the reactants 
and the products and the intermediates sit here. But now let's look at the relative height of each of the peaks. We can see that this first step takes this much activation energy. Where I start at the bottom, the energy of the reactants, and I go all the way to the top of the next hill. This is the activation energy for step one. And then I'm going to come down, and what kind of reaction is this? Where my reactants start out at a low energy, and my products um, end at a high energy. Remember, this is called endothermic. So if I am going uphill in energy, like this, from reactants to products, then that's an endothermic step. So this first step has a very big activation energy, and it's an endothermic step. Now the second step is, has a very small activation energy, so I start here at the valley, the bottom of the valley, and go to the top of the next hill. And we can see that this activation energy is actually very small. Um, and this step starts at a high energy, and it goes down to a low energy. It ends at a low energy. So this first step is endothermic. I go from low to high. But the second step is exothermic. I go from high to low. And in fact, the overall reaction is exothermic because I go from high to low. So the reactants start out here, and the products start out here. But the intermediate is almost always a high energy complex, a high energy uh, material. So reactants, when they're becoming intermediates, are almost always going to go through an endothermic step because the intermediate is higher in energy. It's unstable. Intermediates are not going to stick around long. They're going to, once they form, the activation energy for them to keep going in the reaction is very slow. If I had enough energy to get up over this first hill and make it down here, I had this much energy available to get over that first hill, then I almost certainly have this much energy available to get over the next hill. So as soon as that intermediate is formed, it has enough energy to keep continue on the journey and go down here to products. But now we'll see that the products are going to have a hard time getting back up to reactants because now they've got to go over a hill that's got an even bigger activation energy. So now the activation energy for the reverse reaction, if a product is trying to go back this way to turn from products to reactants, this activation energy is now very large and it's going to be very hard for this ball to get back over the hill. So when we look at the energy of each different step, and I can see that this is endothermic, and this step is exothermic, and the overall reaction is exothermic. Um, I can also see the relative energy of each step. This first step is going to be slow. How do we know that it's slow? Because the activation energy is very large. It's going to take a lot of energy for particles to collide with enough uh, kinetic energy to overcome this activation barrier. The next step is going to be very fast, because it has a very low activation energy. So the rate determining step in this mechanism is the first one. If I want to know what is the rate of this reaction, and I know the rate law of each step, here's the rate law of the first step, here's the rate law of the second step. Well, if I know that the first step is the slowest, then what that means is I don't care about this one. I don't care about the fast step. I only care about the slow step. And how can we see that manifested in the rate of the overall reaction? Well, if I were, if we go back to section 12.3 and we look at some data and we make the rate law for this overall reaction, the rate law that we're going to calculate is this K times NO2 squared. Well, that's odd because remember when we were in that rate law chapter and we said, well, why would that be a 2? There, there should be a 1 here. Right? This is a 1 and this is a 1. And it was kind of, we didn't really understand why, if this is a 1, why would this be a 2 back in that chapter or back in that section? But now we can kind of see more and more why the overall reaction is not necessarily uh, have a lot to do with the rate of the mechanism. Because this overall reaction doesn't show me that the first step is actually two NO2s running into each other. And the second step is an NO3 running into a CO. So that first step, two NO2s running into each other, that is actually a really, really slow step. 
So even though this overall reaction involves both of these steps, the second step is really fast, so its rate law doesn't matter. If I want to know what's the rate of this overall reaction, I only have to look at what's the rate of the slowest step. The rate of the slowest step is the same as the rate of the overall reaction. When I'm trying to pour liquid through that funnel, I can't make it go any faster than the slowest part, which is the small part at the end. Even if I dump the liquid through the funnel as fast as I can, it's not going to speed up the reaction. So even if this reaction down here has a really, really fast rate, the rate of the whole process is the same as the rate of the slowest step. So to validate a mechanism, mechanisms, like I said, we can't actually see transition states. We can see intermediates because intermediates exist for um, a longer amount of time. Maybe sometimes intermediates exist for uh, microseconds or milliseconds or even seconds or even minutes. Sometimes intermediates can even exist for minutes before they're consumed and turn into products. But remember, transition states only exist for a picosecond or a femtosecond or even less. So it's hard for us to prove a mechanism because we can't record it with a video camera and actually watch what the atoms are doing. We kind of have to look at certain clues like shadows, like trying to draw a picture of a house by looking at the shadow it makes at different times of the day. That's kind of how we have to figure out a mechanism since we can't look at it directly. So to validate the mechanism, we have to meet two conditions. The elementary steps must add up to the overall reaction, and we've already done that a couple of times. Remember, we cancel out the intermediates. And the rate law predicted by the mechanism must be consistent with the experimentally observed rate law. So again, if I do an experiment, I'm looking at this reaction. I don't know what the mechanism is. I've never seen this reaction before. Nobody's ever seen this reaction. It's brand new. We have no idea what the mechanism is. I can do this reaction and watch the uh, change the concentration of this and see what the rate is, and then change the concentration of this and see what the rate is. And from that information, I can make a rate law. We did that in, in 12.3. So without knowing anything about the mechanism, I can get this information. But then I want to know, well, what's the mechanism? How does this actually occur? How does this mechanism, this reaction that nobody's ever seen before, how does it actually happen? Then we just kind of have to propose some ideas. We could say, well, maybe it goes like this. Maybe it goes step one and step two. So that's, that's how we get at mechanisms. We kind of have to propose them. We say, well, maybe it happens like this. And how do I know if my proposal is correct? Well, if the elementary steps add up to the overall reaction, and if the rate law predicted by the mechanism is consistent with the one that I just calculated experimentally, then that's a pretty good uh, support of that mechanism. It doesn't prove that it's correct, but it supports it. It says, well, I can't find anything wrong with your proposal, so for now it's a valid proposal until we get more information. So sometimes mechanisms have a fast initial step and sometimes they have a slow initial step. And that can uh, create um, an equilibrium at later points in the reaction, at different mechanistic points in the reaction. So when a mechanism contains a fast initial step, the rate limiting step may contain intermediates. And when the rate limiting step contains intermediates, then um, I'm trying to draw a rate law that has intermediates in it. And it, a rate law that has intermediates in it is not very helpful because I don't know what the concentration of an intermediate is because an intermediate is created and then disappears. So if I'm trying to write a rate law and I want to know how the rate of a reaction is affected by the concentration of reactants, then knowing how the rate is affected by the concentration of intermediates is not very helpful for me. So sometimes when I find that slowest step and it has intermediates in it, I can't really use them. So I have to uh, use a certain tactic, a certain technique, in order to remove the intermediates and substitute them with reactants. So when a previous step is rapid and reaches equilibrium, 
the forward and reverse reaction rates are equal, so the concentration of reactants and products of the step are related, and the product is an intermediate. So if I if uh, if I know the reaction, if I know the concentration of an inter intermediate, and I know how that concentration is related to the concentration of reactants and products, then I can substitute. So I know that was a lot of words. Let's actually look at what I'm saying. So here is an example. I have a reaction um, where the first step is a very fast step. So in that first step, I have a, an equilibrium occurring. Two NO particles bump into each other and they make one of these, N2O2. But then that N2O2 particle kind of falls apart and it goes back this way and it makes two NOs. And then the two NOs run into each other and so on. And they kind of go back and forth like this at equal rates. So this first step reaches equilibrium, which means that I am, the amount of this and the amount of this do not change. They're, they're constant. So here's the slowest step in this reaction. The first step is fast, the second step is slow, the third step is fast, there's three steps in this reaction. I'm trying to figure out what the rate law of the reaction is, the rate law according to my mechanism, and remember to do that I only have to look for the slowest step of the mechanism. So I've identified that this first step is really fast, and the last step is very fast, and the second step is slow. So remember what we're trying to do is say, okay, here's my slow step. What is the rate law for my slow step? Well, the rate equals K times H2 to the 1 times N2O2 to the 1. right? Because in elementary steps, I'm allowed to use these stoichiometric coefficients as the order. So I would generate a rate law that looks like this. Well, is this consistent with the rate law, the experimentally determined rate law that I just determined when I, going back to chapter 12.3, when I was looking at data and writing the rate law for this? Is it the same? Well, here's the rate law that I got from chapter 12.3. I said it's first order in H2 and it's second order in NO. Does, is that the same as this? Well, wait a minute the rate law for this slow step doesn't even have this reactant in it. The rate law for this slow step has an intermediate. Because look, N2O2 was formed after the first step, and N2O2 disappears after the second step. So N2O2 is actually an intermediate. It's not a reactant. So sometimes I come across this situation where I want to know is this mechanism valid? Can I validate this mechanism? Is this reasonable to suggest this? And I would say I have to meet those two conditions, right? And the two conditions are the elementary steps must sum to the overall reaction. So let's do that. Let's make sure that that's right. I've got N2O2 cancels, H2 here. Okay, so then I have two H2s right here. I have two NOs right there, um, NO, N2O and N2O here cancel. So then I have two H2Os right there, and I have one N2 right there. So yes, this, the elementary steps, they sum when I sum them up and I cancel out things that are the same on the left and right, and I add up things that are both on the reactant side or both on the product side. That gives me the overall reaction. So yes, condition one is met. This mechanism is validated at least as far as condition one is concerned. So condition two says, the rate law predicted by the mechanism must be consistent with the experimentally observed rate law. Is condition two met? Well, the rate law proposed by the mechanism is not consistent with the rate law that was experimentally determined because this has an intermediate in it and this has a reactant in it. Are they the same? We don't know. I don't know if one N2O2 is worth two NOs. How could I know that? Well, I'll have to use this information up here. And so what I'm trying to do is get rid of this term. I don't want this term in my rate law. I want this to say something like NO2 
because then I can say, oh yes, this step and this, this rate law for this step and this rate law are exactly the same. So yes, that validates my mechanism. That's what I'm trying to do. So how do I do that? How do I get rid of this intermediate that I don't want in my rate law? I have to take advantage of the fact that N2O2, what's the concentration of N2O2? Well, the concentration of N2O2 is constant. It's not changing because N2O2 is in equilibrium with NO. So what that means is that the concentration of N2O2 is related to the concentration of NO because these are in equilibrium with each other. If I know how much NO I have, then I know how much N2O2 I have because they're related. So what I'm going to try to do is take this intermediate and figure out what the concentration is in terms of this other thing that it's related to, and this other thing just so happens to be a reactant. And then I can substitute that reactant into, the rea into this equation and get rid of the intermediate and justify my mechanism, validate my mechanism. OK, so how do I do that? So um, the rate at which NO turns into N2O2 is the same at rate which N2O2 turns into NO. So the way that we would write that mathematically is to say this. Let's just write the two. I'm going to do this the slow way. So the forward reaction, remember, we, it's easy to write a rate law for an elementary step. Rate equals K times the reactant, NO, raised to its stoichiometric coefficient. I can only do that when these are elementary steps, remember. But because they are, it's easy. Here is the rate law for the forward reaction. What's the rate law for the reverse reaction? Well, if I were just to write this reaction in reverse, then this would be the reactant, and this would be the product. So then I would write K times N2O2 to the 1. So then I can write the rate law for the reverse reaction or the rate law for the forward reaction. So these k's are different, though. The rate law, the rate constant for the forward reaction, well, let's call it k1, and the rate constant for the backward reaction, let's call it k minus 1. They're different numbers. They're going to be different constants. So what I know is that r the rate of this forward reaction and the rate of the backwards reaction are equal. That's what equilibrium means. Rate 1 equals rate 2. So that means K1 and O squared equals K minus 1 and 2 O2. Right? So if these are equal to each other, then these are equal to each other. All right, so now we're getting close, because what I'm trying to do is say, what's the concentration of N2O2 in terms of NO? So all I have to do is isolate that species. So divided by K minus 1, divide by K minus 1. I'm going to flip it around here and say that N2O2 is equal to K1 divided by K minus 1 times n o squared. So now I don't want this term in here, n2o2. What I want is a reactant. Well, look, now I can substitute n2o2 is equal to k1 over k minus 1 times n o squared. So now I'm going to substitute. I'm going to get rid of this and put in k1 over k minus 1 times n o squared. So now, does this look like this? Well, it looks better than it did before, but what's going on with k2 and k1 over k minus 1? These are not in here. The only thing I have down here is k. Well, this k. All of these k's are different. We just throw k around like it's nothing. k, k, this k down here, and I've got k's up here. And so if this is k1, 
and this is K2, and let's call this K3. I'm getting dangerously close to saying K three times. So K3, we'll just give it another number, right? K1, I'm referring to the rate constant for the forward reaction K1, or the reverse reaction K minus one. Here, I can say that this is K2, or K minus two, if I'm talking about the backwards reaction. I guess this one would be K2. I guess this would be K3. And then if I'm talking about the overall reaction, maybe I'd call it K4. So you see what I'm trying to do is just, we're calling them K in each case, but they're not all the same. K is different for each of these different reactions. So this is K4. So what is K4? Because I don't have K4 up here. I have K2, because I'm talking about the second reaction. And I have K1, because I'm talking about the first reaction. Well, it turns out that K4, let's see if I run out of space here. K4 equals K2 times K1 divided by K minus 1. So K2 times K1 over k minus 1, that's equal to k4. So yes, this and this are the same thing. So where this rate constant comes from for the overall reaction, this rate constant is composed of the rate constants from the elementary mechanistic steps. I'm really only concerned with the slowest step, but in order for me to get rid of this intermediate that appeared in the slowest step, I had to substitute it with the reaction from the first step. So the rate constant for the overall reaction contains parts from the second mechanistic step and from the first elementary mechanistic step.